Tonight I want to talk to you again about laying the foundation. This is part five. And we're going to be talking specifically about laying the proper foundation for the family. We're going to talk about the government of God for the family. Now I said to you last week that God established government for the nations. He established government for the church. And he established government for the family. Go with me to Psalms 127. The Bible says in verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchmen wake but in vain. I hope that everybody as a part of Faith Family Church has children is either here tonight or watching online. And that you take very good notes mentally and with your pencil or pen because it makes a difference. It will make all the difference in the lives of you, not only you as an individual, as a parent, but it will also make a major difference in the lives of your children if you will follow the rules and the laws that God has laid down for the family. Now, if, if you've been paying attention, there's been an attack on the family in America for a long time, especially the last 40 years. I remember when it started happening, uh, I wasn't uh, as alert then as I am now to what goes on in, in our nation. But looking back, I remember specifically things that began to, to happen. You know, for a lot of families, the foundation has been destroyed. We read the scripture last week where David asked the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want you to understand something, that... The righteous are those who believe in doing things the right way, which is God's way. Even if your family foundation has been destroyed, even if you feel like I've lost control of my family, I want you to know that you can rebuild the foundations. It's never too late. Now, I began to talk to you in the last couple of weeks about what the Bible says about division. I don't want to go in detail over those scriptures again for, for time's sake because we've got to move forward. But we do know this that the division is between God's way and man's way. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. We know that the way of the Lord is perfect. As I taught you, the word division, it actually means two visions or two ways, and it's what leads to anarchy, whether it's in a nation or a church or in a family. I told you that the word anarchy means lack of government. Uh, for the last two months, at least the last two months, we've watched the news and we've seen the rioters. They've been burning, destroying, and, and looting. It's anarchy. A lot of them have uh, done it with no fear of any type of punishment. Even some of the ones that were arrested, they were immediately turned loose. No fine, no jail time, nothing. That's what anarchy is all about. People just do what they want to with no fear of reprisal. Now, the same thing or something very similar has happened to the family institution in our nation. I want you to listen very carefully to me tonight, next week, or however long it takes me to, to do this, because I really want to approach this in a manner that you can understand. I want you, if you don't know what's happened over these last several years, the last 40 years especially, I want you to understand it. I want you to know what happened. I want you to know how it happened. How did we get to where we are as a nation with the breakdown of the family, where the foundation of the family has been destroyed? You know, a, a lot of people began to pull away from the biblical mandates of marriage and, and what the Bible says about bringing children. As, as people began to pull away from those biblical mandates, and stop being governed by the laws of God for the family, the divorce rates begin to rise. More children than ever are living in a one-parent home. Children are having sex earlier than they've ever had before. I'm talking about as a whole now. If you just study the statistics, you'll find out what I'm talking about. More children are in trouble with the law than has ever been before. And it Folks, that's not just happenstance. It, there's a reason why all of this happened. You know, um, I don't want anybody to be discouraged. 
If you're one of those people that you feel like that you have to lost total control of, the, of your family, you've lost total control of your marriage or of your children, and we're going to be speaking specifically about children, and you feel like, well, I don't know what to do. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to encourage yourself tonight after you hear the, some of the things we're going to be talking about. Be like David who encouraged himself in the Lord. Begin to say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am not alone. There is supernatural help. As I hear the word and I learn the laws that govern the family, and I, and I begin to, to, to follow those laws and apply those laws, I know that God is with me. Jesus said, I, he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. Encourage yourself to know that God will help you. The blood of Jesus is there for you. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit is there to help you. The angels of God are sent to, to help watch over your children as well. As long as you'll do your part. As long as you'll do what God says to do. We're going to approach this from a, from a standpoint of faith. Fighting the good fight of faith. Amen. Fighting the good fight of faith. I have determined that you can do anything by faith. Amen. You can have victory by faith. You can receive healing by faith. You can lose weight by faith. You can get your marriage in shape by faith. You can get your children lined up with the word of God and the plan of God by faith. But you've got to use your faith. What does that mean? I believe what God says. I agree with what God says. I'm going to do what God says. I'm going to expect God to do his part as I do my part. How many know that God is faithful? Amen? So just know this. God wants to save your family. Just like Paul said to the jailer so many years ago, when God shook the prison and the door sprang open and the jailer came and fell down and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? He said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your family. Now, that's a simple statement, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Most people take that and say, Well, I believe in Jesus. Well, folks, there's a lot of folks out there in the world that tell you I believe in Jesus. They believe that Jesus really exists. But it means you've got to take him into your heart. You've got to have his mind. You've got to be willing to, to serve him and to make him not just your Savior, but the Lord of your life. If he's the Lord of your life, he has something to say about everything. He has something to say about what you do, what you read, the music you listen to, the TV programs that you watch, how you raise your children, how you handle your money. I mean, you come to him, to him about everything. Amen? So last week we said no more blaming. No more complaining. No more making excuses. It's time to take responsibility. I want everybody here to say it out loud. I choose this night to take responsibility for my life and the lives of my children in Jesus' name. See, it starts by learning and making a decision to follow God's commandments or God's government for the family. And if you'll do that, if you're willing to trust God, to honor his word, and that he'll work in your children's hearts as you apply, apply the laws of God, I'm telling you, God's going to help you. He's going to visit your house, and things are going to be set in proper order. You've got to get things in order. You know, Paul would send people to churches where things had gotten crazy, arguing, divisions, and he would tell them to go and set it in order. Set that church in order. Set the house in order. God told through the prophet, he told one of the kings in the Old Testament, set your, ho your house in order. I mean, you've got to get things right. Amen. He said, set your house in order. He said, because you're going to die. No, other man repented and made a decision to set his life and get his life in order, and God gave him extra 15 years, right? But how many of you know, listen to me, it's up to you, it's not up to God, as to whether or not you set your house in order. Now, listen to me. What is God's divine order? The Bible tells us, and I wasn't planning on getting into this, so let me make sure I'm going to give you the right scripture. I think it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you're taking notes, just jot this down. The Bible tells us that God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. In the Greek, it means the husband. And the husband is the head of his wife. Not of every woman, but of his wife. That is God's divine order for the home. Now, I don't want to focus on that, but the Bible tells us that that is the order. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. 
The head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. That's God's order. The reason things are such a mess in the families is because the families in America got out of divine order. You've heard the phrase, women wearing the pants. Well, that's just another way of saying that the man has relinquished his responsibility, his place of spiritual leadership in the home, and because he did so, many times the wife had to take the spiritual leadership Often they won't work together, they won't flow together, they won't submit to one another, they won't submit to God's way, therefore there's nothing but chaos in the marriage. I want to, to really, uh, let's, let's get specific about what God says about the children though. That's my main concern right now. I believe that's the concern that's on God's heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. We read this last week, I want to go back to it again tonight. The Bible tells us that if a man also strive for masteries, that means if he wants to win, listen to me, he's not going to win, he's not going to be crowned, except he does it how? Lawfully. Everybody say lawfully. lawfully. You know what that word means in the Greek? Agreeable to the rules. You can't win unless you play by the rules of God. You cannot win as a family, as a mom, as a dad, as parents, and unless you are willing to play by God's rules. I'm telling you, there are rules that you and your family must obey if you want to win this battle for your family. If you want to win the battle for your children. I'm not talking about just the little ones out here. I'm talking about the ones that's in the youth group down there as well. So, you've got to pace yourself. Remember, we're not going back to those scriptures, but Paul, he uh, used different analogies and trying to make points. He talked about you know, a runner. He talked about a boxer, the athlete, the soldier. you got to be a good soldier of the Lord Jesus Christ. He talked about running. Well, you know, as well as I do, that if a, a long-distance runner is going to have to pace himself, I don't want you to get discouraged because you do what I'm teaching you for a couple of weeks and things don't line up immediately. Don't get discouraged. you got to pace yourself for the long run. Amen? And when you pace yourself, determine tonight not to look back, and not to give up. It is not going to be easy. A lot of people, they want everything to be easy. If you have a child that is out of control, whether he's 2 or 15, listen to me, it is not going to be easy to get things in order. It'll probably be a lot easier than what you may be thinking, but let me tell you something, it is possible, and God will help you. Don't allow yourself to run uncertainly. Do you have any goals? If you have some goals, I want you to write them down. If you don't have time to write them down right now, at least go back, make yourself a note to write down the goals. What are the goals that you have for your family, especially when it comes to your children? What goals do you have? You need to write each one name down. This is the goal that I have for this boy. This is the goals that I have for this girl. I remember one night, somebody that's in here right now, said that when they, they testified for the whole church, and she don't mind me saying this, that when she was in high school, her goal was to graduate, you know, from high school as a virgin and not to get pregnant. You know what? Let me tell you something. When everybody else is doing it, it's easy. Just go with the flow. It's a lot harder to go against the flow, to go against the grain, right? It is possible that you can have godly children in an ungodly, wicked world. And I don't know if you have noticed or not, but we live in a very ungodly world. A world that is much more ungodly than it was when we were children. And especially when our grandparents were children, our parents and our grandparents were children. Amen? Did not the Bible warn that in the last days that perilous times would come? We are living in those perilous times. So I want you to determine that you're not going to give up. You're going to win the good fight of faith. Amen? Amen. You're not going to allow yourself to run uncertainly. You're not going to get caught up in shadow boxing, just beating the air with no goals in, in mind. You know what you're running for. You know what you're aiming at. I want this child to graduate. Here's what my daddy. Here's, here's, here's the goal. Now, this may sound silly, but this is the goal my dad had for his six children that every one of them would graduate from high school. You know how many graduated from high school? Three of us. Only three of us. 
That's not a very lofty goal, but at least it was some kind of goal. He got one of them halfway through 12th grade, and she tricked in letting her get married, married with a promise that she'd go back and finish, and she didn't. You see, you've got to have some goals in your life, and you need to write them down, and especially for your children. How many know that a child left to himself will bring sorrow to his parents? A child that is left to herself is going to run out there where there's dangerous, where it's unsafe, where there are predators. I had this thought today. As, as I was talking and going about my business, I had got away from my Bible and notebooks for a while, do, do some things like I like to do. And the whole time I'm thinking, you know, listen to the Lord. And he said, tell them they've got to set boundaries. If you're taking notes, write this down. Tell the parents that they have to set boundaries. Now, at least you're thinking I'm talking about your four and five-year-old. I'm talking about your 15, 16, 17-year-old as well. There has to be boundaries. If you've ever bought livestock or known somebody that bought, bought livestock, you know that they did not bring those cows or pigs or whatever home and just turn them loose out there and let them run wild. They had to give them boundaries. They had to be borders. Why? Not only to keep them from getting out where the predators are, but to keep the predators from getting in to where the livestock is. You do not put boundaries around animals or around children because you, you don't love them. You do it because you do love them. You're not doing it trying to keep them from enjoying what's out there. You're trying to keep what's out there from enjoying your children. There are predators out there. There are more predators than ever before. They are right here. Jefferson, Kershaw, Lancaster, wherever you live. There is a whole list of them. Some of them, you can find them. You can go to that list online, and you can find predators. But people that hadn't been caught yet that are predators as well. Yeah. And they are constantly trolling, yeah. watching, to see if they can deceive some young boy or girl into believing that they are someone who they are not, who they claim to be. We live in a very dangerous world. I don't want to put fear in anybody, but I want the parents of Faith Family Church and anybody else that will listen to learn that we have a responsibility to set borders and boundaries for our children. Now, we're going to talk more about that later, but I wanted to get that out right now. God says we're going to have to do things His way. We're going to have to play by the rules. We're going to have to abide by the laws, the government of God for the family if we are going to be successful in building our family. Now, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes because I want you to really understand this. Raising a child is not about the parent. It's about the child. Raising your child is not about you. It's about the welfare, what's best for your children. Now, why do I say that? Because a lot of parents will begin to make excuses. Well, I don't have this, and I can't do that, and I have to work around my job, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. It's all about what's best for me and not what's best for my child. You've got to pray. You've got to seek God. You've got to talk with your husband or your wife or if you're a single parent. Get some advice from some other people. Figure out a way that you can bring up your child in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You can provide a place where they are loved and they feel loved, where they are safe and they feel safe. Listen to me. Without compromising what the Word of God says. This is so important that you understand what I'm trying to get across to you. It is our responsibility to educate our children. When the Bible talks about bringing up, and I didn't get to finish this last week, when the Bible says to bring up your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, if you study out the word nurture in the Greek, it is talking about the education morally and every other way. It is our responsibility to see to it 
that our children are trained and taught the Word of God, the way of God, and nothing interferes with it. There may be times when you have to snatch your child out of a certain teacher's room. Well, you may have to take them out of school completely like we did Rebecca when she was in, what, seventh grade? Because when we discovered not only was her teachers allowing violence in the classroom with no discipline whatsoever, but they were also reading a, a book out loud where they used profanity. And the teacher encouraged it. Using God's name in vain, right in the classroom, in front of seventh graders. That's when we made a decision then to take her out of that public school. Now, I'm not going to get into the debate about public school versus, you know, homeschooling, Christian schools, and all that. You're going to have to pray and seek God what's best for you and your family. Number one, what's best for your child, okay? Because I know that there's some situations where it just seems impossible to do it any other way. But at least know what's going on in that child's classroom. Take those books. Look at those books. Find out what's in those books. What are they teaching? Most of the, I won't say most, I will say a lot of the school books now are contrary to the doctrines of the Word of God. They have rewritten history in many cases. There is a lot of doctrine in the school books that lead children away from God, away from traditional marriage, away from traditional child rearing. Everything that is based on Judeo biblical Christian principles, the education system has done all that it can and is still working over time to take the children in a total different direction. Now, stay with me. This is important, okay? <clears throat> There's only one correct way. Now, I know a lot of people say, well, I know, you know, some people choose this type of parent." Parenting, this style of parenting, I follow this psychologist and this, you know, child expert. There's only one correct way. There's only one way, and that's God's way. His way is right. It's the Bible way. And I'm going to tell you all something. For those of you that have been to college, modern psychology has done a lot of damage. Ask Quincy. He'll tell you. Modern psychology has done a lot of damage to the biblical family especially when it comes to what the Bible teaches concerning one man and one woman, heterosexual parents, their children by birth or adoption. And a lot of Christians, they should have never listened to the mental health professionals. Should have never listened to them. Today, most of society, including most Christians, have swallowed hook, line, and sinker what modern psychology has taught. And instead of helping the family, it's destroyed the foundation of the family. How many of you know that raising a child was never supposed to be stressful? A lot of parents today, especially mothers, say that raising a child is the number one most stressful thing in their life. Now, if you'd have asked Grandma about that, she'd have said, but nothing to it. You know why? No, I don't want to get ahead of myself. <clears throat> it used to be raising children, and I'll just say Grandma's way, in the old days, the old biblical way. It used to be a just straightforward common sense. Child did something wrong, it cost him. He was disciplined, he was loved, it was over and forgotten about, and you move on. Okay? But how many of you know that psychology's main doctrine is one of non responsibility? It's not the child's fault. It's not her fault that she's like she, she is. It's not his fault that that's the way he is and the way he acts out and what he does. See, Christianity teaches that we're fully responsible for our actions. We're fully responsible for our behavior and that only by accepting that responsibility are we going to receive forgiveness 
and the grace of God to help us to overcome the past. Now, I don't know if y'all have ever known this or not, but this Bible right here is one giant blueprint for all of life. Within the pages of this giant blueprint, there are small blueprints. There's one, how to have a successful business. There's one, how to have a happy marriage. There's also one for raising godly children and a lot of other things. There's a blueprint for everything in life, as a matter of fact. How a church is supposed to run, how a nation is supposed to operate. But listen to me now. This blueprint for raising children, it should have started, it should have been used the day the child was born. The very day the child was born. What did Proverbs 22, 6 say? Train up a child in the way that he should go. Train up a child in the way that she should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get into great detail. A lot of you will remember this from several years ago. If you study this out in the Hebrew, it's a picture. It's a picture of a child who's just born, a newborn. The nursemaid, or whatever they called them, what they called them? Was it a nursemaid to help the woman? The midwife. midwife. She would take the newborn baby, and she would take her finger and rub it in uh, figs, the juice of the figs, get it on her finger. She would put it in the newborn baby's mouth, rub his gums and his palate until he would start the sucking motion. Then she would take the child and lay it upon the mother's breast. That's exactly what they stop training up a child. In other words, you've got to start it the day they're born. Now, some of you are already saying, well, I'm 10 years behind. Or I'm 15 years behind. Guess what? By the power of God, you can get caught up. Amen? Amen. You'll be like Elijah. When the power of God come on you, overtake the, the king's horses. You overtake everything the world's done. Amen. Now, that may mean that you have to do what I told one couple many years ago. When they first came here, they had been living together for a long, long time. They had a house full of kids. Uh, they'd never been married. They had lived a wild, crazy, sinful life of drugs and alcohol and party and profanity. And they came in here. They got saved. They wanted to get married. I did a, just a very simple marriage ceremony for them. It wasn't long after that they started talking to us about the children, how out of control the children are. And so I counseled with them. One of the first things that I told them, go home, sit all the children down, apologize to them. Tell them that you are sorry for the way that you raised them, that you didn't know any better, you were, had not been saved, you didn't know about the things of God, you didn't know the Word of God, you didn't know how to be a good father, a good mother, you didn't know how to train them up in the way they're supposed to go, and say, I apologize. But now, starting this moment, we are going to do things by the book. And I told them, I promise you, it's not going to be easy. They are going to rebel. They're going to do everything they can, scratching, kicking, hollering, and crying, to try to change your mind, to trick you, to deceive you. I said, but you have got to take charge of your family. Some of you may have to do the same thing. You may have to sit down and apologize. I'm sorry that I let you get away with so much. I'm sorry that I did not create an atmosphere where you were loved or f at least felt loved, where you were safe, where you were protected. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but many times if a child who has been in a very lenient atmosphere in their home where they have to go and stay with somebody who is strict on them, to begin with, that child will really get upset and mad about it because they're so used to having their way. But it won't be long before they will actually thank this person and say, I wish it was that way at home. Most prisoners that have been interviewed concerning this have said, I wish my parents would have been stricter on me. I wish my parents would have not have let me get away with the things that I got away with. And it starts very early. For those of you who will try to tell me, I trust my child, I have, no, I'm not going to say it. The Holy Spirit just told me, don't say it. Okay, I'm not going to say it. Please, Lord, can I say it? No. 
Child, listen to me. Trust has to be earned. Trust is something that a child earns through the years by showing that they are obedient, that they will do what they are told to do. As they get older and they have earned that trust, there comes a time when you've got to, you know, you've got to kind of give them a little more rope. Because when they're 18, then they can go and do what they want to do. But hopefully, by the time they're 18, you have done it in such a way, now they want to serve the Lord. They don't want to run out there and go crazy and go wild in the world because they know the cost. Okay? Now, the Bible has to become your parenting manual. The Bible. This is your parenting manual. Some of you are probably thinking, Pastor, I wish you gave us a manual to go by. Well, I'm giving you one right now. This is the parenting manual right here. This is the blueprint. How many of you know that the way that people raise their children for about 6,000 years, up until about 40, 50 years ago, from the time of Abraham and Sarah, generation after generation after generation, all raised their children the same way. Parenting did not change until the late 60s, early 70s. That's when it began to change. Think about this now. In the 1960s, there was a culture shift. And uh, that culture shift, it was defined by television. Because the, the liberal elites... I'm talking about the people that were, you know, in, over the education system, uh, Hollywood, the entertainment system, the media. They discovered a tool by which they could put into every home in America and they could feed their agenda on a daily basis, week after week, month after month, until they could brainwash the American people to begin to think like they wanted them to think. Now, I want you all to hear me well, because this is exactly is what has happened in our nation. As a matter of fact, it's still happening right now. I'm going to tell you all something. You might not like it. I don't care. The biggest lie that has ever been thrown on the American people is going on right now with the coronavirus. It is the biggest lie that they have ever got away with, and they're getting away with it. Somewhere around between 60 and 70 percent of the people of America right now believe the lies that we've been told. One reason is because they won't study for themselves. They won't research for themselves. They won't discover the truth. Many of them don't want to know the truth. Well, Pastor, do you believe that there is a coronavirus? Yes. And I believe there's a flu. I believe there's cancer. There's car wrecks and heart attacks. And people die of all of them. Not anymore. It's <laughs> but in the last few months, that is true. I don't know if y'all been watching or not. The death rates of everything else have gone down while the death rates of the coronavirus, so to speak, has gone up. But guess what I found out this week? In Australia, five out of every million have died. Where in America, they're telling us that 450 out of every million have died. It's a lie. The whole thing's a lie. There is an agenda behind it. It is all political. I can go anywhere I want to, around anybody I want to, and I will not get the virus. It will not affect me. As a matter of fact, I can tell you this. Your children can go to school, and they can go to, they can go to school with children who's got grandparents at home that might have had it. They're not going to be hurt, and your children's not going to be hurt. It's all a lie. It's happening now. It started happening with the family in the 1960s. And I want y'all to understand this. I really want you to understand this, how it happened, okay? That culture shift came. It was used to promote the, this, this radical, progressive agenda 
of the liberal elites. Now, when I was growing up, when I was a little boy, we watched Leave it to Beaver. How many remember Leave it to Beaver? Father Knows Best, you know, Harriet and whatever his name was, and Ozzy and Harriet, that kind of stuff, you know. Well, here's the thing. When they went to bed, they slept in separate beds. They didn't show them, husband and wife, they didn't show them get in the same bed. They went in different beds. They were good, clean TV shows, pretty much based on biblical marriage and how you raise children. The children were taught to be respectful. The children were taught to honor. But then what happened? All of a sudden, they got replaced with all these TV shows that reflected just how wrong traditional views of marriage and family were, you know. I remember as a teenager, there was a, a TV program called All in the Family, Archie Bunker. I think my daddy liked that show so much because uh, Archie reminded him of himself, you know. He was your everyday hard-working American man. You know, he believed in uh, a man and a woman in marriage. He was against homosexuality. He was against abortion. He was against all these things that was beginning to happen in America. But they wanted to change. They had to change the American people's minds. You see how subtle the devil is? The devil didn't just come into the garden and tell Eve, God's a liar. He didn't say that. He said, has God said? Did God really mean it? Is that what it really meant? The devil's very subtle, people. So, you know, Archie, he's got this daughter. She's been off to college. She married this guy. And he's a liberal, you know, meathead. That's what he called him, meathead. So they come back home after college, and they moved into the house with Archie and his wife. And, uh, you know, they argue all the time. And, of course, every show was always showing that, you know, how Archie, how old-fashioned he was, how just... Set in his ways he was, you know. It showed him as, you know, the, the, old, the old mean, tough, old-fashioned guy, you know, that just wouldn't get caught up with the times, you know. That's what Meathead would tell him. You've got to get caught up with the times. You're behind times, you know. Huh? Well, he was racist as well. And I, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Listen to me. Meathead was always trying to show him the error of his ways. And like most people, Archie had some things that needed, he change, needed to change. But what they focused on more than anything else was those liberal agendas that they were trying to push through the courts. They were trying to push through the voting booths. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And isn't it strange how at the end of these shows that they would begin to change their mind and realize just how wrong they were. Well, maybe me maybe here, maybe you do have some light on something. Maybe you do uh, see things better than I do. Maybe I should change my way a little bit. That's what happened. TV show after TV show after TV show. It went on through the 70s and the 80s, and now you've got every dad. Every dad, he's just a bumbling fool. <laughs> yeah, every dad, just an idiot, you know. Yeah. You know, the mom, she's the only got any sense, and, 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 of course, she, you know, she runs the family. What was happening, people? Little by little, the, the, the biblical, traditional things that we were taught, or at least some of us were taught, and we saw it from our parents and our grandparents, all of a sudden, everything's changing now. Everything's starting to change. There's a breakdown in the, the traditional authority. I want y'all to, to, to write this down. Authority and respect for authority must be restored. Authority and respect for authority must be restored in the family. It must be restored in the hearts of your children. I don't know if y'all know this or not, but Western civilization, America itself was built upon the Judeo-Christian principles of God's Word. And all of a sudden, now, here comes the secular, the education, the media elites, and they begin to demonize all authority. I don't care if it was political. I don't care if it was military. I don't know some of you that are older remember the way that the, the 
the, the soldiers coming home from Vietnam were treated. You know, the hippies, they're out there, you know, they're having their love fest and, you know, their marijuana parties and their drug-induced orgies. And then when the, the troops would get off the plane, they'd show up screaming at them, spitting at them, cussing them. All authority started breaking down. It was a time when you disagree with a politician, you still showed respect because he had been voted in office. It didn't make no difference whether he was a Republican or Democrat. It didn't make no difference whether he was black or white. It had nothing to do with it. You showed respect. Today, do you know that the average millennial has no respect whatsoever for the, uh, the office of the president? The office. We've got to teach our children. We've got to rebuild these foundations. Amen? I mean, what about the authority in the church? What about the authority in the family? See, they begin to attack these two cornerstones of traditional marriage and the traditional way of bringing up a child. Now, some of you that were in college are going to recognize a couple names because in the late 60s and the 70s, all of a sudden, Instead of, like the Bible taught, when a woman had a child, she's supposed to go talk to her mother and her grandmother. You know, little Johnny, he's two years old, and, and he's doing this, you know. And Grandma said, well, I remember, you know, your Uncle Billy when he was that age. And, and he started acting that up, you know. And I went out back, and I broke a switch, and I wore his tail out. And I sat him down and told him, don't you get up for two hours, and then I'm going to make you read the Bible. But what did they do? They started listening, instead of listening to Grandma, they started listening to uh, Benjamin Spock, you know, Joyce Brothers, Thomas Gordon. These became the so-called child experts of the day. Americans got to the point to where they'd rather l read books written by people who never had children, who have, you know, big letters behind their name, than Listen to grandma who raised 10 children, you know, and all of them are successful men and women in life. As a matter of fact, Thomas Gordon, he had a, uh, started doing these seminars called Parent Effectiveness Training. And uh, it was used to train thousands, I mean literally thousands of thousands of psychologists, family counselors, social workers, and the gullible parents, they swallowed it up. One of Gordon's followers, her name was Dorothy Briggs, she wrote a book. It was a bestseller in 1970 called Your Child's Self-Esteem. Now, y'all listen to me carefully. Let's see if you've been affected the way you think about bringing up a child. Let's see has it affected how you believe it's supposed to be done compared to how God says it's supposed to be done. She wrote this book. Oh, it was a, man, this thing was hot. Book, it was a hot seller. Your child's self esteem. It gave birth to what they called the Democratic family. The Democratic family is one where the parents and the children are to relate to each other as equals. You and your child are equals. And this transformed the whole family situation, the whole family dynamic in America. It, it transformed it. Instead of a, being a parent-centered family, it became a child-centered family. Everything was around the child. I've got to make sure this child has really high self-esteem. You know, high self-esteem, that trumps respect for others. Just as long as the child feels good about themselves, you know. That's what it was all about. The whole thesis of the book of everything that started being taught in the colleges was all about making sure that the child had really high self-esteem. See, they said the parents, um, they're not supposed to tell the children what to do, but you're supposed to reason with them and reward them when they cooperate with you. Okay? I wish somebody would have told that to my daddy. No, I don't either. I'm just teasing you. I can only imagine what my dad would have said. Karl Marx would have loved this. You know, Karl Marx, he was a socialist communist. 
uh, him and another man wrote the uh, Communist Manifesto, one of the things that he said is this, for socialism to succeed, the traditional family has to go. Socialism, communism, got into America back in the 50s. It began to work its way into the government. They are here now. They have a very strong, firm hold in America now. Some of, their, some of the top promoters of this thinking is Bernie Sanders and people like that. George Soros. They want to do a totally away with the traditional Christian family. The way things are done according to the Bible. Now, by the 70s, here's what happened. The liberal colleges, they had this intent. Their intention was to um, put the parents and the children on equal footing. They did this in order to des destroy the authority of the parent. Parents gradually lost more and more authority in the home. It is a common occurrence today. If you don't believe me, just hang around Walmart for a little while. It is a very common occurrence for a small child to tell their parent to shut up or to slap them, to throw something at them that they don't, you give them to them and say, eat this, and they throw it back at you or throw it in the floor. I told you, you got to start when they're born. You think it's tough now. That five-year-old, you wait till they're 15 or 20. I told you last week, and you accepted the challenge, you will not allow your child to go to hell. Amen? Amen. Well, out of all this craziness came a whole new wave of therapists, and they released on America, and they began to take sides with the kids and, the sad part is that the parents they gave in to this kidnapping of their children. That's literally what it was. It was a kidnapping of the children of America. Oh, my, my, my. Isn't it weird that for almost 6,000 years that, Amer that, that people followed, not, not in America because America hadn't been here that long, but the world pretty much as, as far as they claimed to have faith in God. Christian nation followed the teachings of the Bible. And then all of a sudden, Things begin to change just in the last 40, 50 years. Now, listen to me carefully. Please, I'm very, very serious about this. Don't get mad with me. Listen to what I'm saying. Write down some things. Study it out for yourself. I want you to know the difference between the biblical teachings and what psychology today is teaching, okay? The old way, based on the Bible, says that a child is fundamentally bad and needs to be rehabilitated. Listen to what I'm saying to you. The Bible teaches that a child is fundamentally bad and needs to be rehabilitated. You don't believe me? Proverbs 22, 15. I'll just show you two verses. Proverbs 22, 15. Foolishness. Everybody say foolishness. Is bound. Tied up. In the heart of a child. How do you gonna get it? How you get it out? How you get that foolishness out of a child? Huh? The Bible said beat him with a rod, it won't kill him. It'll save his soul from hell. The rod of correction. Listen to me carefully. I am not trying to get anybody to be abusive. I do not want you to be abusive. I would be the first one to report you if I found out that you were abusing your child. When I began to discover these things, way, way back there, my wife and I, we said we're going to bring the children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It is our responsibility to train them in the ways of God. It is our responsibility to take responsibility for their lives and teach them how to be responsible as well. And so they learned very early. I'm talking about as soon as we knew that they understood yes and no. How do I know if my child understands yes and no? They understand that before they even start walking. While they're crawling. And they crawl up and they reach for something. And you say no and they hesitate and they look at you. They know what you're saying. Now if you said no and they didn't even pay a bit of attention and you know just kept on doing it anyway. You go over to them and you say take the hand off of it and say no. That's how you teach them. 
But when they do this right here, they're testing you. Right there. Right there. You have to ask yourself, did I fail that test? If you're honest, a lot of you have to say yes. But we started. And as soon as we knew, it hurt. They cried. That's how they learned not to do it again. Because it hurt. They learned a principle. It cost if I disobey. There's going to be discipline if I disobey. It's bound in foolishness. It's bound in the heart of a child, the Bible says. The rod of correction drives it from them. Psalm 51, verse 5. Don't misunderstand this verse in the King James. David said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin that my mother conceived me. He wouldn't say my mother, you know, was, was doing something sinful when, I, when she got pregnant with me. He was basically saying my mother was sinful. Why? Because of Adam. How many you know the life of the flesh is in the blood? We are sinners by birth. That's why you must be born again. David made it very clear. Listen, I was shaping in iniquity and in sin. Listen. But this new teaching that came along, and it's so prevalent today, says that children are fundamentally good. They don't do bad things intentionally. They just make errors in judgment. Uh, they make bad choices. Therefore, since there was no evil motive behind it, then they shouldn't be punished for what they did. And besides that, you know, punishing a child, that hurts their self-esteem. That's that ridiculous teaching of psychology. The old way, the right way, God's way, it enforced responsibility on the child for their behavior. You have got to do that. You've got to enforce responsibility on your child for their behavior. You've got to make them understand. Based on the way you behave, whether you're going to be rewarded or whether you're going to be disciplined. You see, that new way of parenting absorbs all responsibility. The misbehaving child, you know, used to be a perpetrator in, in grandma's day, mama's day. I mean, it was like you committed a crime. You was a criminal. And buddy, I mean, you got caught, you were going to pay for it, okay? But now that same child is a victim. Just a, just a, you know, just a little victim, and they need some therapy, maybe some drugs, or maybe both. And so by the time they're 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, they're sitting in some, some therapist's office, and they're on two or three kind of antidepressants. And, and if you listen to me, I'm telling you right now, by the help of Almighty God, I'll get you off those antidepressants. I'll get you off all that medication, all that nerve Medicine. If the world would listen to me, Brandis wouldn't have a job. <laughs> but the world's not going to listen. Because God will heal you. And not only will he deliver you from illegal drugs, he will deliver you from prescription legal drugs. Yes. But what's happened? What's happened in America? We put these children on this stuff when they're 10 years old, sometimes younger. They grow up with it all their lives. What are they to expect when they get grown? I'm telling you right now, take responsibility for your life and say no more. I am not going to live that way. I am going to be free from everything that is not of God. Amen? I get so sick of this psychobabble. That's all it is. A bunch of psychobabble, you know? Well, I just think that your child, because of something that happened to them when they were very small, that they have suppressed memories, and if maybe we could help them to remember what happened to them and to face it, that maybe they would be able to overcome all of the hurt of their past. Well, I got a better way. Get up here and put hands on you, and by the power of God and the blood of Jesus, you'll be not only healed, delivered, set free, you'll be forgiven for anything that you've done, amen, that you're responsible for, and you can get a brand new lease on life, starting right now. Amen? 
Man. I purposed tonight to slow down. I didn't want to come across as being hard or harsh. I really want you to take this serious, though. Just because I'm not jumping up and down and screaming and hollering, I, want you to take the, I don't want you to take it any less serious. All right? If it's this heavy on my heart, it's, this is on the heart of God. Okay? I'm about to, I'm about to wrap it up. Now, listen to me. Um, all that psychobabble stuff, it, it's never worked. It's not going to work. It never will work, but God's way does. Okay? But listen, you've got to do what the Bible teaches us to do. You've got to instill that respect for authority back in the home. You've got to do this, folks. I'm telling you. Uh, there is so much that we've got to talk about. I encourage you. Talk to your children. Let them know. I am not your friend. I am not your friend. I am your father. I am your mother. I am your parent. I am not your friend. After you are grown and you have moved out of the house, we will be friends then. But as long as you live under my roof, you're going to respect my authority. We are not equals. You do not have a say in some things. When I feel that it is right, when it is relevant, I will listen to your opinion. There are times when we do need to talk about things, and I do need to listen to you. You understand what I'm saying? It's very, very important. But you've got to have the wisdom of God to know when to say, no questions asked, this is the way it is. And, of course, as they get older, naturally as they get older, you want to sit and talk to them. You want to hear what's coming from them, what's in their heart, what they're going through, what are they facing. But you can't do it being a friend. You've got to be a real parent. They got to know that you are there, that you got their back, their front, their side. Amen? That you're covering them with love, with discipline. In case you're wondering, discipline is just as critical in the raising of a child as love is. As a matter of fact, as we go further into this, you're going to discover something. They are divinely connected. Love and discipline are divinely connected. True, real love. I'm talking about based on the kind of love that God talks about in the Bible. It's connected to discipline. If God didn't love me, he would not discipline me. Now, I'm going to prove these things to you from the Scriptures. If God loves me enough to discipline me, should I not love my children enough to discipline them, to teach them, to train them, and yes, to spank them when needed? Now, am I going to spank Rebecca? Am I going to spank Holly? I think not. They would probably spank me now. You see what I'm saying? You've got to understand the seasons of life. As I look around, for example, all right, the season of life that you two are in, your oldest child's old, eight years old, and the youngest with how many months? Huh? So you're, in a, you're in a season right now. Oh, what a wonderful season it is that you can shape these children's lives. You can shape their thinking for God, for the kingdom of God. All right? Y'all are in a different season. Not only are you in a different season, you're in a whole different league than what they are. Because here, we are, here you are with kids that are older. Y'all haven't been married that long. You've taken the role of a stepfather. Man, you're talking about things have to be worked out and worked through. That's the reason I said what I did back on Father's Day about blended families. And I encourage all, all, of, all of the men of the church, just because if that child living in your house under your roof, just because they might not be your biological child, doesn't mean you can't be a father to them. That means sometimes mama's got to get out of the way. And, but I'm not talking. Listen to me. Once again, once again, people say, well, pa Pastor, you want me to, 
<coughs> you want me to, to whip this 15-year-old child? It's not even really my own child? We're going to talk about this stuff. Sometimes you just got to use some sense. Sometimes you just got to use some plain old common sense. There's other ways to train and to discipline besides using the rod. Those older children, listen to what I'm saying to you. Those older children, you know what hurts them worse than anything else? Take away everything they love. <laughs> Car keys, cell phones, laptops, anything else they got that they love. You don't go anywhere but to school and church. You don't talk on the phone, your phone, my phone, your daddy's phone, your brother's sister's phone. You don't text. You don't email. You don't wave out the window and wave at them across the street. You are grounded. And when I say grounded, I'm talking about grounded. I'm not talking about this grounded where they still sneak around and get away with stuff. Good gosh, can I talk about privacy? No, I can't. It's, it's, if I get started on that, we'll be here another 30 minutes at least. But we will talk about it. We are going to talk about it. Now, at least do like I did. The time the man, you know, jerked the knot on, on me when uh, I hadn't been saved long at work that night. And he said what he did and made me so mad. And I went home and God said, he's right. You need to listen to him. I don't care if you get mad as long as you go home and repent. And do what's right. Start doing what's right. Start taking notes. Start taking notes. Start watching. Here's your, here's your assignment. Between now and next Wednesday night. Well, I won't be here next Wednesday night. But when I get back, listen to me. Somebody will be here preaching. I, I won't be here preaching, but somebody else will. But when we get back on this, here's your assignment. I want you to observe your children without them knowing it. I want you to get a notebook, and I want you to start taking notes. I want you to start observing your children. I'm talking about taking notes. What's my child's personality? What do they like? What do they do not? What do they don't like? What sets them off? What are their triggers? What do they enjoy about life? What do I see in them, the talents that God has put on the inside of them that I need to be a part of to help them and train them and help develop that? Y'all understand what I'm saying to you? Take notes. What is the goal that I have for this child's life? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. I know, Father God, that as we act upon your word, that your Holy Spirit begins to move supernaturally in our child's lives, in our own hearts. I ask you, Father God, to bring correction into the hearts and minds of every person who hears these messages as to how we may have yielded to the world, even unknowingly, how that we must make corrections. We must get our homes in order based on your word. Help us, Lord, to be willing to do what's right. Give us the grace. Oh, Father, I pray for your grace upon every mother, father, grandparents, everybody here that's bringing up children. I ask you to give them a supernatural, give them more grace, that they'll not get angry, they'll not get frustrated, that they'll not get discouraged and quit. But, Father God, that they'll take the necessary steps, knowing that you honor your word, you're going to work in the children's hearts and their lives to bring about change for the glory of God. In Jesus' name, amen.